today. Uh, the ambassador is a graduate of uh, Harvard College with a master's from Oxford University and a JD degree from the Georgetown School of Law. He is a longtime uh, student of and professional uh, in the areas of foreign policy, uh, including a stint of uh, 14 or 15 years with the Foreign Relations Committee staff and the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee from 1979 to 19. 93. He then left that position upon uh, President Clinton's appointing him ambassador to uh, Croatia, where he was actively involved in uh, the Croatian and Bosnian peace processes, as well as uh, assuming uh, principal responsibility for the U.S. humanitarian programs in the former Yugoslavia and U.S. relations with the United Nations peacekeeping mission headquartered in Zagreb. Uh, he played a principal role in devising and implementing the strategy that ended the 93-94 muslim Croat War and helped negotiate the Washington Agreement that established the Federation of Bosnia-Herzegovina. After leaving the um, ambassador's position, he was asked by the United Nations uh, from January 2000 to 2000, August of 2001 to serve as director for political, constitutional, and electoral affairs in the United Nations Transitional Administration in East Timor. Throughout this period of time and continuing to the present time, he's had uh, a deep interest in uh, many visits to and, and, and much uh, development of expert knowledge in uh, Iraq and the surrounding areas, uh, uh, including time while he was on the Foreign Relations Committee visiting the country numerous times, uh, Ambassador Galbraith was one of the first Americans to expose the uh, murderous treatment of Saddam Hussein against the Iraqi Kurds in the late 80s, and his uh, reports uh, were instrumental in the Senate passing a, uh, a resolution of comprehensive sanctions against Iraq in 1988. He has maintained his uh, interest and his regular visits to uh, Iraq uh, since that time, and he has uh, just recently, in his book, The End of Iraq, uh, shared some of uh, his thoughts about uh, the problems in that country, uh, the American uh, role in um, the, the uh, apparent inevitable disintegration of the country, uh, and some suggestions about what the United States might do uh, going forward, given the current situation. So it's a delight today to have him here with us. He's going to speak for uh, 30 to 45 minutes, uh, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions from you. So please help me in welcoming Ambassador Galbraith. Chris, thank you for that um, very generous introduction. And uh, also uh, to Duke for the inv uh, invitation here to the Sanford Institute. Uh, uh, it's a real special pleasure to be here because uh, one of the senators that I worked for on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee from uh, 1986 until 1992 was uh, Terry Sanford. And uh, he was a, uh, a very uh, kind person, uh, uh, a pleasure to work for and with. and. Uh, well, he served just one term as a senator. Uh, he was an important player in helping to shape some of the issues of that time, including those that I will uh, discuss here today. Uh, he entered the Senate in 1987 uh, at the beginning of the uh, Iran-Contra scandal, uh, and then in 88, uh, was one of the supporters of the Prevention of Genocide Act of 1988, which passed the Senate, uh, co-sponsored by Claiborne Pell and the other senator from North Carolina, uh, Jesse Helms, uh, which would, had it become law, imposed uh, comprehensive sanctions on Iraq for the gassing of the Kurds. Uh, the, um, uh, and then, of course, he participated in the debate over the first Gulf War uh, before uh, losing his bid for re-election in 1992. Um, perhaps it's worth beginning with the Prevention of Genocide Act, 
in uh, 1988, and by way of advertisement, uh, much of what I'm going to tell you is uh, in the book. Uh, but um, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, one of the things I argue in, in the end of Iraq is that uh, the United States has been getting Iraq wrong for not just uh, since 2003, that's pretty obvious, but uh, certainly since I started working on it professionally it, beginning in 1980. Uh, the interesting thing is that um, what was the response of the United States when, uh, as we know, and let me back up and say, as we know, when uh, the, uh, uh, one of the rationales for the war in 2003, one of the phrases that we heard from President Bush was that uh, uh, to justify the war was that Saddam was such a brutal dictator uh, that he gassed his own people. Uh, and, uh, but it's interesting that at the time he was gassing his own people, 1988, uh, there was a, first an attack on March 16, 1988 on the Kurdish city of Halabja. Uh, the Reagan, administ it was Reagan administration tried to obscure responsibility for that attack by suggesting that both Iran and Iraq had gassed Halabja, although in fact there's no evidence that Iran ever used chemical weapons in the Iran-Iraq war, which was still going on. Uh, and uh, it would have been rather illogical for uh, Iran to have gassed Halabja since it was held by its allies, the Kurdish guerrillas or Peshmerga. But uh, it was a way to mute the international reaction to uh, a horrific atrocity that was broadcast around the world because the Iranians allowed television cameras to come in and so there were pictures of some of the 5,000 people who died, uh, including um, perhaps most memorably uh, a man holding a baby uh, cut down as they were trying to flee. But then in, uh, in August of 1988, on the 20th of August, the Iran-Iraq war ended and five days later Saddam began a series of poison gas attacks uh, in Dahok Governorate. Now, uh, if you know the geography of Iraq, that is the part of, of, of Kurdistan, of northern Iraq, that is adjacent to Syria and to Turkey. In short, the other side of the country from Iran, and anyhow, this was after the Iran-Iraq war had ended. Uh, there was no question as to who was responsible uh, for those attacks. Obviously, it was uh, Saddam Hussein. I was uh, in Vermont uh, at the time and um, went, returned to my home and returned to Washington. Uh, I believed, uh, partly based on what I'd seen in Kurdistan the previous year during a trip, and I'd stumbled across the systematic destruction of all the ver uh, villages in Kurdistan, that this was genocide and that Saddam's goal was the elimination of the Kurdish population in Iraq. Uh, and that also fit with the ideology of Saddam Hussein, which was a, 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 an extreme Arab nationalist uh, ideology. Uh, the Kurds are not Arabs, uh, and so therefore they really weren't part of the master race, if you will, within Iraq. Uh, I went to see the, my boss, uh, Claiborne Pell, who was the chairman of the committee. We discussed it. He said, what do you think we should do? I said, well, I don't know that there's much we can do, but we need to catch Iraq's attention. Why don't we in introduce legislation to impose sanctions on Iraq? He agreed. Uh, we were running toward the end of the session, so I actually dictated the bill to my secretary. It took about an hour. Every sanction I could think of. We the U.S. at that time was providing massive foreign assistance to Iraq uh, in the form of credits that enabled Iraq to purchase goods in the United States. Uh, so in effect, it was the third largest recipient of U.S. assistance. So one of the sanctions was to cut off that assistance. Another was to prohibit uh, the importation of Iraqi oil. Um, Pell went to Helms, who co-sponsored, and with that combination, a liberal Democrat from Rhode Island and a you know, arch conservative uh, from North Carolina, uh, everybody, you know, the bill was almost non-controversial, passed the Senate unanimously, and then uh, Pell asked me to go out and document uh, the use of chemical weapons so that 
we can make the case when the Reagan administration denied that Iraq had done it. So I went out and interviewed the survivors who had fled across the border into Turkey. Well, as it happened, the Reagan administration did not deny that chemical, the Saddam had used chemical weapons. In fact, George Shultz, the Secretary of State, was quite outraged by what Iraq had done. And so he had the State Department publicly denounce Iraq for using chemical weapons against the Kurds. So I thought uh, that, uh, uh, well, it'd be, then it would be a sure thing that our sanctions legislation would pass. But no, the Reagan administration said they opposed the sanctions legislation, that it was premature to take such a severe action against Iraq for the actual use of chemical weapons at the time they were being used. Uh, and ultimately, the Reagan administration was able to defeat sanctions. The next year, in 1989, the new Bush administration responded by doubling U.S. assistance to Iraq. So it's a very ironic situation that, again, at the time that Iraq was using chemical weapons, it was too extreme even to cut off U.S. taxpayer support for Saddam Hussein. Fifteen years later, the fact that he had used chemical weapons in 1988 became a rationale for war. I was somewhat amused when Rumsfeld then said in this uh, uh, last month that though critics of the Iraq war were guilty of appeasement, and he compared them to uh, Neville Chamberlain and the British uh, uh, policy toward Hitler in the 1930s, because of course I thought there was a much more recent example of appeasement, uh, namely the appeasement by the Reagan and first Bush administrations of Saddam Hussein that continued up to the 2nd of August 1990. Now, there was a reason that Rumsfeld chose not to refer to that, uh, because he himself was an architect of that appeasement policy. Reagan had sent him to Iraq in 1983 and 1984, after Iraq had started using chemical weapons against the Iranians, um, to uh, begin negotiations on diplomatic relations restoring diplomatic relations. He met twice with Saddam Hussein. He never mentioned the use of chemical weapons to Saddam. He did in the second visit apparently mention it to the foreign minister, Tariq Aziz. But of course, in a country like Iraq, if you don't mention it to the top guy, uh, the message is that it's not important. And obviously, what followed then was the beginning of US assistance programs to Iraq that eventually amounted to billions of dollars. Uh, and a decision that we, and th this was probably the most critical form of assistance we provided Iraq, was um, intelligence that enabled them to use the chemical weapons to target the Iranians. Now, there have been allegations that the U.S. provided chemical weapons to Iraq. That didn't happen, and I don't think we provided chemicals to Iraq. That wasn't important. Chemical weapons are run-of-the-mill World War I technology. But they're only useful if you can hit concentrations of troops. And for that, you need to know where the Iranian troops, the enemy troops, are concentrated. That requires intelligence. And only the US and the Soviet Union had the satellite technology that would have enabled the effective targeting of um, the chemical weapons. And so that was the main assistance that we provided Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war. Now, what was the reasons for this uh, appeasement policy? Uh, well, a, the, the, of course, the major concern that the uh, United States had in the 1980s was that Iraq would lose the Iran-Iraq war and that Iran, revolutionary Iran, would become a regional hegemon, uh, that it would, uh, uh, take, it would defeat Iraq, uh, that the Shiite majority in Iraq would uh, line up with Iran the strategic balance in the northern Gulf would change in a way that was disadvantageous to the United States. Hence, this justified providing assistance to Iraq even so that it could uh, use its chemical weapons. Now, of course, why did they continue the appeasement policy after the Iran-Iraq war ended? Well, there's a certain amount of uh, inertia to this, but there also was a belief that Iraq, that Saddam Hussein, could be a, a moderating force. Uh, yes, he was a strong man, but he could be a, a, a strong man on our side, not only countering Iran, but also uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, as against the, he would be on our side in the Cold War, which was winding down at that point in time. Now, my critique of this uh, at the time, uh, which was supported by the majority in the Senate, was that um, a, a, a regime that had launched an unprovoked war on its neighbor, Iran, that had engaged in genocide against its Kurdish population, that had used chemical weapons in violation of the 1925 Geneva Protocol, was not really likely to be a moderate regime. That, there was, that the in, internal character of that regime meant that it was, was not going to be a stable partner of the United States. Um, that view, as I say, was rejected by the Reagan administration. Incidentally, the national security advisor who coordinated the opposition to sanctions on Iraq was Colin Powell. The next year, when the first Bush administration took the decision to double U.S. aid to Iraq, who sitting on the National Security Council was the Secretary of Defense, Richard Cheney. So you understand why Rumsfeld felt it was a lot better to go back to the 1930s to talk about appeasement than, of, of Hitler than to talk about appeasement of Saddam in the 1980s up to the 2nd of uh, August 1990. Now, one of the other interesting things about this is the strategic rationale for the appeasement policy, namely Iraq to counter uh, Iran. Because uh, one of the consequences of this war has been what? It has the, the, the country that has emerged uh, in, uh, as the great victor of the U.S. invasion of Iraq has been Iran. Uh, indeed, uh, in 2001, uh, Iran, beginning of 2001, Iran faced the Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, which was, uh, of course, a, a Sunni Salafi movement closely linked to Al Qaeda. The, the, uh, the, the Salafis, are, these are very fundamentalist Sunni Muslims. Uh, and they consider the Shiites to be apostates. In fact, uh, uh, in, many of them think the Shiites uh, are not, that, that they have no protection, that they, it's, they can be killed. They aren't really Muslims. Uh, so on the, and of course, Iran, uh, I will tell you, not everybody in the Bush administration knew this, has, is a Shiite majority uh, country. In fact, 98%, you're, you, you're laughing, I'll, uh, you shouldn't. 98% Shiite. Uh, no, it's not quite, but it's uh, over, well, 90, 85% Shiite, something on that, 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 that uh, order of magnitude. Um, uh, so on the one hand, there, there was the Taliban, and on the other side, uh, to the east, and on the west was Iraq, uh, run by Saddam Hussein, the most bitter enemy Iran had. They, they, after all, they, Iran had continued the Iran-Iraq war for eight years, or for Anyhow, it, it, Saddam basically was prepared. He had launched it in 80. He was prepared to make peace in 82 after the Iranians had driven uh, Iraqi forces out of Iran. Uh, but the Iranians continued it for another six years for the express goal of getting rid of Saddam Hussein. And they failed. So what happened? The United States came in. First, we got rid of the Taliban. And then in 2003, we got uh, rid of um, Saddam. And what replaced Saddam? Well, it was the Shiite religious parties that, uh, who, who, who won a majority in the Iraqi elections in 2005, but basically began to take power in Iraq from, two, from 2003 on. Uh, parties that had been uh, supported by Iran for decades. Uh, the largest of these political parties, the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq, was actually founded in Tehran in 1982. Uh, and so one of the, 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 the main strategic outcome, indeed, of the uh, US invasion of Iraq has been to empower and bring to power in Baghdad and in the south of Iran, of Iraq, where the oil is located, uh, Iran's allies. Now, this is, of course, ironic because the most memorable phrase of the Bush administration, no doubt, is the axis of evil. Uh, that referred to, as you know, North Korea, Iran, and Iraq. Now, that phrase, uh, which incidentally was slipped in, put into the speech by a Canadian speechwriter uh, 
uh, with, without reference to any of the professionals of the national security apparatus. Um, but that, that phrase was a bit geometrically challenged because, of course, an axis is between two points and not three. Um, it is historically challenged uh, because uh, the, it's, it's a reference to the World War II axis, which was the alliance between uh, Germany and Italy, hence the Berlin-Rome axis between two points. Uh, Japan was not formally part of the axis, although it was in alliance with the axis. Uh, but the axis of evil in, in 2002 when Bush gave that speech was not an alliance at all, as I pointed out. In fact, you could not find two more bitter enemies in the world than Iran and Iraq. But today, uh, Iran's closest ally in the world is Iraq. So while there was no Tehran-Baghdad access in 2002, there is, in 2006, a very close Tehran-Baghdad uh, Axis. Uh, in fact, I describe in the book uh, an incident I think that uh, exemplifies um, in several ways where Iraq is, and I'll, perhaps this will lead into the next point I want to make in this talk. Uh, I attended in on June 4th, 2005, the swearing in of the Kurdistan Parliament. Uh, Kurdistan in the north uh, has its own regional government and had a parliament that was elected on the, in the elections of 30th January 2005. Uh, it was a great event. Uh, the uh, president of Iraq was there, who was a Kurd, uh, so, and Kurd Jalal Talabani. Uh, Kurds are enormously uh, proud that uh, one of their own is president of Iraq, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, as they say of him, uh, you know, this is the first democratically elected president of Iraq in the country's history. Indeed, uh, the first democratically elected leader in this part of the world, which is so ancient that it is reputed to be the home of the Garden of Eden, he's the first freely elected leader there since Adam was there alone. So imagine, and he's a Kurd, imagine how historic that is. But in spite of that, while the stage for the parliament swearing in was wall-to-wall -wall flags, Karl Rove would have been envious of this optics, not one of those flags was the flag of Iraq, the country of which Talibani was president. They were all flags of Kurdistan. The, uh, there was some speech making. The American representative got up and made a speech about the U.S. commitment to a Democratic, fe democratic, federal, pluralist, and united, unified Iraq. And then the members of parliament took their oath and they were supposed to swear allegiance to the Kurdistan region of Iraq, but when they got around to it, they sort of dropped the words of Iraq. So that suggested this unified part wasn't really too strong there. Uh, and then came a speech by the Iranian representative. Uh, he is, uh, Aga Panahi was his name. He's the, chief of the Iranian intelligence, uh, uh, well, the, the sort of the spy chief for the Iranians in Erbil. Uh, and he, his speech, I, I'm going to give you his entire speech. It was by far the shortest of the day. He looked directly at the American and he said, uh, this is a great day for us. Everywhere in Iraq, the people we have supported are in power. He didn't say, thank you, George Bush, but that was the unstated message. Um, I suppose there's some other points that might be drawn from that. Uh, one is that we don't have a unified uh, Iraq. Uh, in fact, uh, Kurdistan in the north is uh, in all regards an independent state except international uh, recognition. Uh, the Iraqi flag is banned from flying in Kurdistan and it's been banned for years. Uh, the Iraqi army is prohibited by Kurdistan law from going there. Uh, the Iraqi central government ministries do not operate in Kurdistan. Uh, and the population voted in a referendum on the 30th of January 2005 uh, for independence by a margin of 98% to 2%. Uh, the um, Shiite 
in the, the, the Shiite region in the south has been uh, really more or less from 2003 on. And I, I, was in, I arrived in the country about four days uh, after the statue fell and went to the south about three or four days after that. Um, already, the, religious, the mosques and the religious parties were taking control. The south is not governed from Baghdad either. It's governed by the Shiite religious parties who uh, have operate their own little fiefdoms in different parts of the south. Uh, they apply not the constitutional freedoms of which we heard so much in the Iraqi constitution, but they apply a, a version of Islamic law copied from the Iranian model, enforced by militias, and generally much more severe than what you see in Iran. Uh, in the Baghdad is uh, today, as you know from reading the newspapers, it's divided. It, it is the front line of a civil war in Iraq that claims easily 100 lives, lives a day. Uh, and the city has divided. It was once a city that was at least partially mixed, but today it's not. The east is uh, Shiite, uh, under the control of almost all the neighborhoods of the Mahdi army. This is the militia of the loyal to the most radical of the Iraq Shiites clerics, uh, Muqtada al-Sadr. And the West is uh, controlled by uh, is Sunni. Uh, it is controlled by uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, Al-Qaeda offshoots, imitators, and some neighborhoods by former Ba'athists. Uh, but it's not controlled by the central government. Uh, in fact, ministers uh, live in the green zone. They rarely go to their ministries because if they leave the green zone, uh, they get stuck in Baghdad's traffic. They're sitting ducks, ducks for assassination. Uh, and finally, the Sunni center of the country is basically a battleground between uh, uh, the uh, uh, Sunni insurgents, the coalition forces uh, led by the United States, and what we call Iraqi army force troops but really are Shiite soldiers uh, who are battling the insurgency. And certainly the central government in Baghdad doesn't exercise any control there. So uh, where are we after three years after the invasion? As I pointed out, we have Iran in a dominant position in the south, uh, in a dominant position in the central government. But we also have a, situa a situation where there's a civil war where the country has broken up, the central government doesn't really control anything, the South is, uh, operates uh, autonomously in an informal way. Uh, basically, Baghdad and the Sunni center are controlled by no one. They're, they're battle zones. And Kurdistan in the north uh, is institutionally uh, a, a separate country. Uh, that being uh, the case, then we can analyze what are the prospects for success for the United States uh, mission in Iraq. Uh, and perhaps it's worth stating what that mission is. The mission is, according to President Bush, a unified and democratic Iraq. Now, what, what would be the prospects of achieving that goal given that Iraq has broken up and given that there's a civil war between the Sunnis and the Shiites? Uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions from anybody who doesn't believe that there's a civil war, because uh, I'm happy to support that proposition, uh, or who believes somehow that the country has not broken up. But if we, if we were serious about the mission of a unified and democratic Iraq, we would have to undertake two military tasks that we're not now undertaking. First, we would have to dismantle the Shiite theocracies that have been set up in the South, that would mean we would have to disband the militias that keep them in power, and we would have to effectively remove the Iranian influence. If we were going to do that, we would, of course, be taking on the Shiites as an enemy. Now, the Shiites are 60% of Iraq's population. The Sunni insurgents, who are the, our current military problem, are just 20%. So in essence, we would be taking on an enemy who's support in the population, it, who is supported by a population three times as numerous as the current problem in Iraq, and where we have not been wildly successful in countering the insurgency. 
Uh, and of course, while there are some foreign fighters who are fighting with the Sunni insurgents, the Shiites have a very powerful ally right next door in Iran. So, uh, but I think it's very clear that the United States has no intention of dismantling the Shiite theocracies, of disbanding the militias, or of countering Iranian influence. If we wanted a unified, so we aren't going to build a unified Iraq from the south. If we wanted a unified Iraq, to, we would also have to end the civil war. Now, uh, and, and, and this is actually a very important part of the, why this nomenclature about civil war is so sensitive to the administration. If it's a civil war, then you cannot expect the Iraqi police and army to provide security in mixed areas like Baghdad. Why? Because if it's a civil war, the army and the police are not neutral. They're not national institutions. They are partisans in the conflict. That's why. That's why that, that, that the, the administration is constantly saying, no, 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 no civil war. But of course, it is a civil war, and the army and police are not neutral. The police at least in the mixed areas, are almost are overwhelmingly Shiite, and they are, they are the death squads that are carrying out the, the executions of the Sunnis. Uh, it's a, of course, it was the Sunnis who started this by car bombs and other attacks on, on Shiites, including on ordinary Shiites, but once the Shiites took control of the at police apparatus after the January elections, they've organized themselves, and they've been uh, uh, it, it, it targeting an increasingly expanded list of Sunnis. And well, at the beginning, it was suspected insurgents and former Ba'athists, but now the death squad simply target anybody who has a Sunni name. Uh, so it, it, it is impossible to think that the Iraqi police and the Iraqi army is not much better, it's somewhat better, but not much better, could be expected to provide security in the mixed areas because there's no Iraqi army unit or police that would be trusted by both Sunnis and Shiites. So if we were serious about ending the civil war, what would, what would, what would we have to do? We would have to become the police of Baghdad. Uh, that, of course, would involve many more troops. Our troops would also would have to be out on the street uh, soldiers can be in tanks and, and well protected, but police cannot. Uh, so it would mean many more casualties. I can promise you that the administration is not going to do that either. So we, in fact, uh, uh, have a deployment in Iraq which the administration does not intend to accomplish its goal of a unified and democratic Iraq. They are not serious about it. Uh, I might add that the element of fighting the Sunni insurgency has also been a failure. And of course, the reason it's been a failure is because there's a civil war and because what is described to you as Iraqi units who are our allies in fighting the insurgents are in fact Shiite units. And when you look at it from the point of view of the Sunnis and the so-called Sunni triangle in the center of the country, what they see, what they don't, they don't see those, these guys as Iraqi. They see them from the alien branch of Islam. They see them as people who were installed by the Americans and who are closely allied with Iran, the country that they see as the national enemy. Uh, and the Sunni Arabs have who were basically always ran Iraq from its founding until 2003. They see themselves as the guardians of the country. Uh, so. The, the strategy that we have uh, basically is not defeating the insurgency, and the reason it's not defeating the insurgency is that uh, by using Shiites against the Sunnis, we simply increase support, greater support for the insurgents. Uh, in fact, it, it, it's worse than that because uh, not, the Sunnis uh, may not all support the former Ba'athists and the uh, Islamic fundamentalists who are behind the insurgency. But civil wars have a way of strengthening the extremists because the choice in a civil war becomes the extremist on your side. If you're a Sunni, it's a choice between Al-Qaeda 
and the Mahdi army. And the difference is, you may hate Al-Qaeda and everything it stands for, but the Mahdi army wants to kill you for being a Sunni. So there isn't much choice at all. Uh, and of course, uh, if we wanted a unified and democratic Iraq, we would have to persuade the Kurds to give up on, their, on the independence they now have. That isn't going to happen. In fact, the United States um, uh, has not pursued, although it says the goal, its goal is a unified and democratic Iraq, uh, not only is it not prepared to undertake the mission of a building unified and democratic Iraq, it actually has facilitated the breakup of the country. I think this is probably most pronounced in the Iraqi constitution, which is a document adopted by 80% of the people of Iraq, and it is a document that breaks up the country. The, it, 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 um, it creates a powerless central government and very strong regions. Uh, since this is, uh, uh, we're at the law school, I will say to understand the Iraqi constitution, you simply need to read two articles, Article 110 and Article 115. Article 110 says, the, uh, is a list of the exclusive powers of the federal government, of the central government. It is an extremely short list uh, and includes foreign affairs, it includes uh, defense policy, and understand this word policy, it includes uh, fiscal policy, uh, it includes monetary policy and currency, and it includes weights and measures, so that a kilometer in Basra is the same length as one in Erbil. Uh, it does not include oil or other net water. Uh, it does not include uh, well, there's a, a, a water that comes from outside the country is included, but other water isn't. Um, it does not include uh, oil, doesn't include other natural resources. Uh, it does not include taxation. The central government has no power to tax, and at least no exclusive power to tax. That's not listed in Article 110. We have to look at Article 115 to understand the meaning of this. Article 115 says... Uh, any power that's not listed in the exclusive power of the federal government is either a shared power or belongs exclusively to the region. And in the case of, of shared powers, regional law prevails. So effectively, there are no shared powers since regional law prevails. There, there is only a very short list of exclusive powers of the central government. Everything else belongs to these regions. The regions under the Constitution have the right to maintain their own foreign representation offices. They have the right to have their own armies, and they control substantially, have substantial control over the oil, although there are some provisions on sharing the revenues. Not the control, but sharing the revenues. Uh, it, it, it's, there's, a, there's some nuances I'd be happy to discuss for those of you who've read it, but that's the basic uh, a structure of the Iraqi constitution. It's not an accident. It wasn't poor drafting. It was, uh, in fact, the product of, um, of, of what the maximum that uh, Iraqis could agree with each other because, in fact, they don't want to hold the country together, George Bush's assertions to the contrary. The U.S. helped broker this constitution because, in fact, the, the way it was drafted was not like Philadelphia in 1787, everybody coming together to draft a common country. It was more like the Dayton peace negotiations that ended the uh, Bosnia War. All three groups, the Sunnis, the Shiites, and the Kurds, never met together to have a serious discussion of the Constitution. And U.S. officials then, including the ambassadors Almay Khalilzad, basically ended up doing shuttle diplomacy from group to group trying to get agreement on common texts. And that's why the Constitution is as it is. So uh, we have a situation in which the, the central government has no authority, uh, in which uh, uh, the Constitution is a plan for the breakup of the, of the partition of the country, uh, because, it, it, as I say, it, it allows for the creation of strong regions. Kurdistan is already recognized, 
but it allows other groups to create their own regions, and the Shiites are moving ahead to create a region in the south. Uh, uh, it, um, so it allows for the, crea the Constitution allows for the creation of, um, of, uh, of, of, of strong regions. Uh, and, and so it, it, it's fairly obvious that if we, if we wanted to put this country back together, it would be a huge undertaking. And you would also have to ask the question, why would you want to put back, to uh, back together a country that basically is not desired by a substantial part of its own people? Uh, what I would say now, then, is the case for a different policy in Iraq is based on the fact that it's not, it is not a, if you will, a liberal case, but a, a conservative case, which is that we, we are locked into a mission where we cannot succeed, where we, we're not even serious about trying to succeed. Uh, and so let's analyze. We, we can't speak of a strategy for Iraq because it isn't a country, but let's look at a strategy for the different parts of Iraq. In the South, uh, if we're not going to promote democracy, disband militias, or counter Iranian influence, why are we there? Uh, the region is actually perfectly stable. But we, we sh I, you know, the, 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 if we're not accomplishing anything, then the coalition ought to withdraw, and I would say it ought to withdraw immediately. Uh, it's true that Iran's influence will be dominant, but that's exactly the case uh, today, and we're not doing anything to counter it. One advantage of withdrawal from the South is that uh, right now, coalition troops in the South are effectively hostages uh, to Iran if we should take military action against Iran over its nuclear program, because the Iranians then can respond by attacking coalition forces in the South directly and through their Shiite allies. The cent uh, Baghdad uh, it's, it is the middle of a civil war, but if we're not going to do anything to stop the civil war, why should we be there? It's true that if we pull out of Baghdad, there'll be horrific sectarian killing. And if we stay in Baghdad, there will be horrific sectarian killing. Uh, with regard to the Sunni areas, the strategy we're pursuing is not working. Uh, I would suggest as an alternative that the Sunnis be encouraged to form their own region with their own army and, and uh, hope that a Sunni army might be able to provide security in the Sunni region and that more moderate elements might take command, and this is a very relative term, uh, it might be Ba'athists as opposed to Al-Qaeda, might take control of the Sunni region. Uh, I can't guarantee that a Sunni region and a Sunni army will, in fact, be prepared to take on the uh, Al-Qaeda. But I can be quite, we can be quite sure that the, that the current strategy isn't going to work, and so the alternative has some chance of success. And it seems to me that our one remaining overriding interest in Iraq is that Al-Qaeda uh, and other groups like it, the homegrown groups, groups in Iraq, do not have a base there from which they can attack the United States or the West. In short, that it is not like what Afghanistan was under the Taliban before September 11, 2001. Uh, the, again, the best way, hope of, of doing that, or the, 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 the one hope for doing that, is for the Sunnis to police their own area. But there's no guarantee that that will happen. Therefore, my, the final element of what I would suggest is an alternative approach would be to deploy an over-the-horizon force, if you will, in Kurdistan, uh, which, which, from which the United States could move into the Sunni areas if needed to disrupt al-Qaeda or to attack al-Qaeda bases. Now, there are people who have argued for an over-the-horizon force in Kuwait, or in some cases, like the Philippines. The problem with, with, with a complete withdrawal from Iraq is that once we're out, we'll never get back in. Uh, uh, that would be politically very difficult in this country and politically very difficult in Iraq. But if you're still in what is nominally Iraq and Kurdistan, uh, you, you are adjacent to the Sunni areas. You can move fairly rapidly if you have to. You also would have local allies because the Kurdistan army, the Peshmerga, numbers well over 100,000. Uh, and they are the, 
most effective, no, they are the only effective indigenous fighting force in Iraq. Uh, so, and then the, the other advantage of, of a force in Kurdistan is it would discharge a moral debt that we owe the Kurds who fought on our side in the 2003 war. And unlike, say, deploying to Kuwait, where the United States is no longer very popular, the United States is extremely popular in Kurdistan. It's the one place, in, perhaps in the world, where George Bush could still win an election. <laughs> now, you laugh, but it's true. And do you know why? Because everything that makes him unpopular in the United States and in Europe and my other parts of the world, namely that he screwed up Iraq so badly, makes him extremely popular in Kurdistan. They love him for screwing up Iraq. <laughs> you know, that he wrecked the country. He's it, terrific. Um, one of the Kurdish leaders, a friend of mine, says of Jerry Bremer, the US uh, uh, administrator in Iraq, he said, uh, we Kurds, we're going to build a statue to Jerry Bremer, uh, to Ambassador Bremer. He, uh, he did more than anybody else to break up Iraq. Uh, so yeah, Bush is popular precisely because he screwed up Iraq. Uh, so it would be a place where the local population would uh, welcome us. This alternative strategy, which I describe in the book, uh, perhaps more eloquently than I do in this presentation, uh, it, it, it of course does not produce an ideal solution. Iran still will have the greatest strategic advance since the Treaty of Khazari Shireen in 1639, which had established the boundary between the Sunni-ruled world and the Shiite-ruled world. But that's done. We're not going to reverse that. Uh, it will get the United States out of most of Iraq and out of the fighting. And why is that important? Because we have other interests in the world. George Bush spoke about and uh, the danger that would come from the worst states having the most dangerous weapons. And the most dangerous weapon by far is the nuclear weapon. He spoke of an axis of evil. At the time he made that speech, North Korea was a party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It was subject to a four-power uh, power agreement in which uh, the, the US supplied fuel oil and they agreed they kept their plutonium under safeguards. It's true that they might have been cheating and, and having a secret uranium enrichment program, but they were cheat if so, they were cheating slowly. They might this year have had the, enough uranium for one nuclear weapon, but apparently not even that, at least based on the uh, public reporting about the intelligence. Uh, instead, we broke off that agreement. Uh, North Korea became the only country to withdraw from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It removed its... Uh, 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 plutonium from safeguards, and it detonated uh, last week a nuclear explosive device. We've had the president state repeatedly that he, we will never accept a nuclear armed North Korea. What are we doing about it? Exactly nothing. In fact, this is the, the, the least effective strategy in international relations. Threats that are not, that are not backed up by, by force, threats that your adversary sees as totally empty. My brother lives in Texas. I think they call it there, all hat, no cattle. Um, Iran, in 2002, uh, was, uh, its uranium enrichment program was frozen. They now have, going ahead with enrichment, they're going ahead with a nuclear program. We have all sorts of tough statements, no action, uh, and Iran, it, it appears that we're going to do nothing to stop Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. So it's a little hard for me to see how that has been made us uh, safer or more secure. Uh, and, but it is a, if we're going to deal with those challenges, we have to have a credible military option. I'm not in favor of use of military force against Iran and North Korea, under the, at least under the present circumstances. But I do know you can't negotiate unless you have a, a military alternative. That's the logic for withdrawal, in term, terms entirely in terms of our own national security. We, 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 we face basic cho a choice. We continue with a mission that will not accomplish its goal in Iraq, uh, and, we, uh, and, uh, and we, we do nothing about Iran or, and North Korea, or in the alternative, we, we withdraw from most of Iraq, preserve our interest in, in stopping Al-Qaeda, uh, and then have resources that are available and some credibility to deal with, with uh, the problems of uh, 
of North Korea and Iran. That gets me to my final point. Uh, one always should say, finally, in a speech, it gives the audience hope, uh, which is that um, uh, we ought to um, negotiate with North Korea and Iran. Uh, President Kennedy said, and actually my father penned these words for him in the inaugural address, we should never negotiate out of fear, but we should never fear to negotiate. This administration seems to be afraid that it will be taken to the cleaners by North Korea and Iran. Uh, I mean, somehow we managed to negotiate with the Soviet Union, but uh, they're, they're, they seem to be afraid of negotiations with these two countries. I think it's unlikely that we would be taken to the cleaners by either of them, although maybe with some of the people who've been running Iraq, that's possible. Um, uh, if you don't have a military option and you don't have allies that support you, and that's the situation we have, what is your alternative? A, a course of action in which these countries simply proceed further down the nuclear road? The North Koreans say that they're prepared to enter into an agreement that would freeze their nuclear program in exchange for a mutual security treaty with the United States, diplomatic relations, maybe some economic assistance. Mutual security treaty, what they want is a pledge that we won't, a treaty which says that we won't attack North Korea, which we don't plan to do. Uh, I don't know if they will, if, if they're serious about that, but won't find out unless we talk to them. Uh, it may be that uh, the Iranians are, would be prepared to freeze their nuclear program in return for a commitment that we don't do regime change in Iran. My God, would anybody want to do regime change in Iran after having seen how we did it in Iraq? I mean, that's also giving up absolutely nothing. Uh, if there is going to be regime change in Iran, it certainly won't be done with the help of the United States, uh, and, and certainly not the help of this administration, which has been so demonstrably incompetent. So again, there's a logic for negotiation. I don't know if a bargain can be reached or not. But uh, if it could be, it seems to me that that's something worth exploring. Let me stop here and uh, turn this over to questions. OK. Um, I don't think I heard you say turkey today. So I, I just wonder how they fit into the Kurdistan equation or about the president. Yeah. Uh, again, I think you have to analyze Turkey's position uh, strategically as we should have analyzed the region ourselves before going in. Uh, what does Turkey see? It sees the same thing that exists, namely a de facto independent Kurdistan. Uh, given that there are some 18 million Kurds in Turkey. This is not something that they would like to see. But it exists. What are their options? How can they, what can they do about it? Well, in theory, there's a military option. But remember, it took Turkey 15 years, cost of 30,000 lives, to defeat the PKK. That is a, an indigenous Kurdish separatist uh, uh, guerrilla movement. Uh, and. Um, uh, they at most numbered 5,000 guerrillas at their peak. Now imagine, and that was on Turkish soil, imagine what would be involved in a military option in Kurdistan of Iraq. It would be involved foreign, uh, 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 unfamiliar terrain, a hostile population, uh, dealing with a Kurdish, Kurdish Peshmerga force that's well over 100,000. It would lead to a huge rupture in relations with the United States. Uh, it would mean the end of any chance of joining the European Union this century. There are some people in, ba in, in Berlin and, and Paris who are kind of hoping the Turks do something this stupid. But uh, uh, frankly, Ankara has been much smarter than that. Uh, I think there's a widespread recognition in Turkey that there is no military option to prevent the emergence, uh, uh, to, to deal with the independent Kurdistan, which already exists. Uh, and so. Uh, Basically, there's a, they've adopted de facto another approach, which is to have good relations with Iraqi Kurdistan, 
uh, the largest uh, uh, foreign investor in Kurdistan is Turkey, uh, overwhelmingly from Turkey. The Turkish government is strongly supporting Turkish companies that have made oil deals, not with Baghdad, but with the Kurdistan government, with, with, with deals made without any reference to Baghdad, and which therefore presumably increases the financial independence of Kurdistan. Uh, and the Kurdish leaders have, all, and have also been pretty shrewd. They've tried to cultivate Turkey. They've thrown business Turkey's way. Uh, and so there, there is a view in Turkey, and I, I, I would admit that this is a minority view, but it exists not only in the press and academic circles, but also within the deep state and the government. And it goes something like this. Well, there's, you know, an independent Kurdistan exists. Probably full independence is inevitable. Uh, Maybe this isn't such a disaster. After all, who are the Kurds? They are secular. They uh, uh, are pro-Western. They aspire to be democratic. And they're non-Arab. In short, they're a lot like us. Uh, and that an independent Kurdistan would probably be a satellite of Turkey, especially if Turkey adopts the right policies toward it. And, and, and also, it would be a useful buffer against uh, a Shia, Iranian-dominated Shiite Iraq. Now, I don't want to overstate this. There's a debate in Turkey about how to handle it. I think there's very little interest in the military option. Uh, and there are an increasing number of voices who, who adopt this, later, this latter position I've described. Nonetheless, the next year is going to be a rough one because there are presidential and parliamentary elections in Turkey. And the Kurdish question is a very emotional issue in Turkey. Uh, I find it hard to believe that. Uh in this new configuration in Iraq where the Shiites are, are in power now, it's, it's coming like a, as a surprise to the U.S. I, I, uh, because it's empowering Iran in the region. And I'm not sure that was a strategic goal. Uh, I mean, or it's, it's a goal that was not strategically planned. In, in terms of the, the way I see it is maybe uh, to play the enmity between maybe Shias and the kind of uh, Sunni Wahhabism coming from Saudi Arabia and spreading throughout the Middle East uh, with the intention to kind of divert attention from the presence, American presence that is so contested in the, in the area. Uh, can I just ask, where are you from? Morocco. Uh, I, I ask that question because when I give this, this talk, uh, when they're either Europeans or uh, other non-Americans, uh, they simply cannot imagine the incompetence <laughs> that has gone into Iraq. So they, they simply conclude that this must have been intentional. There must have been some design. Uh, and I mean, you, you, you just can't imagine that it could be that stupid, right? <laughs> I, I, I sympathize with that. I mean, after all, this is a, a superpower, a great country. But sometimes it really is like this. Um, let me, that, that you say we could, not, we, how, we could not have failed to anticipate that Iran, the, the, the obvious point, that Iran would emerge as the great victor. I mean, this, this wasn't a great, shouldn't have been a surprise. I mean, lots of people saw it. Well, let me, uh, let me tell you. The architect of the war was Paul Wolfowitz. He testified before Congress that a Shia, the Iraqi Shiites would be a danger to Iran because they had the holy cities for Shiite Islam of Najaf and Karbala, and they would they and they would be living in a Western a, a country liberated by the United States, a democracy, and that would undermine Iran. Great argument. Just happens to be no factual basis for it. I mean, he, uh, the notion that the Iraqi Shiites were going to be secular. Um, he, he might have paid attention to the name of the largest political party, the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq. It does give you a clue as to the agenda. It's not like Democrat or Republican. That might be hard to explain. Um, or uh, I'll give you another example. In January of 2003, George Bush met with three Iraqi Americans uh, who are friends of mine. I know them very well, who strongly supported the war. 
uh, and actually heroic people. And so they got into a discussion. This is obviously two months before he orders troops into Iraq. What is Iraq going to be like after the war? Uh, and it became clear to them that the president did not realize that Islam was divided into two branches, the Sunnis and the Shiites. <laughs> now, I don't mean, I do not mean to tell you that he didn't realize, he didn't know the difference between Sunnis and Shiites. That, that, that's kind of complicated. <coughs> but he didn't know that there was a difference. It's a bit like dealing with Ireland and thinking they're all Christians. It, it does tend to make it hard to get your, hand, your head around it. But of course, now, now I tell this story not to make the point that the president was ignorant. Yeah, OK, he was that. But that's, that's not the point. It reflects the lack of planning at the highest level of the US government about what po the post-war issues in Iraq. And after all, if you did not know that Islam was divided between Sunnis and Shiites, you could not have anticipated that one of the outcomes of the invasion was a civil war between two groups that you didn't know existed. And you could not have anticipated that Iran would emerge as the, a Shiite Iran would emerge as the, with the influence that it now has over Shiite Iraq if you didn't know that there were Sunnis and Shiites. I mean, so this is an, I mean, obviously, lots of other people, presumably everybody else in the administration understood that there was this division. But in terms of high-level decision making and, and thinking through the consequences of the war, uh, it didn't take place. And I already described the axis of evil speech. Think about that as a strategic proposition. Uh, and put aside whether you're a liberal, Democrat, uh, liberal or conservative, Democrat or Republican. Just look at it strategically. Let's, let's say, you've, you, now obviously when he gave that speech, he decided to go to war with Iraq. Let's assume that he had Iran on his list, uh, that we want to do re regime change in Iraq and, and ultimately then regime change in Iran and Syria, and I think that's the case. I think they hoped that a democratic Iraq would serve such an example that it would begin to topple Iran and Syria. The Wolfowitz testimony I described to you basically reflects that. All right, let's say that you, that's your, uh, uh, your, your goal. First you're going to do Iraq, and then you're going to do Iran. Does it make sense to announce this uh, to the world? Let's put yourself in the Iranian <coughs> shoes. You hear that. What is your thinking going to be? Your thinking's going to be, if the Americans succeed in Iraq, they're coming after us next. What are you going to do? Make sure the Americans don't succeed in Iraq. How hard is that, given the influence that you have? Well, this is, of course, what's happened. The Syrians, there was all this talk about Syria being on the list. What are you going to do if you're a Syrian leader? Oh, well, I'm just going to wait for my turn? No. Again, <laughs> it, you're going to make sure the Americans don't succeed. And that's basically what the Syrians have been doing. Again, you can be, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is not liberal or conservative. This is simple strategic logic. It was, it was irrational. It didn't make sense. And there's so many other things that didn't make sense. Uh, after all, if you had this goal, democratic Iraq was going to undermine uh, authoritarian regimes in Iran and Syria. OK, that's a bold gamble. Why would you have sent to administer Iraq utterly unqualified people? Paul Bremer, the administrator who was sent there, uh, had, had <coughs> never been to Iraq, didn't speak Arabic, uh, uh, had never worked in a post-conflict situation, and he was given two weeks to get ready. He, he was asked to do the job two weeks before he arrived in, in Baghdad. Uh, and, and then he uh, dissolved, he, he took a couple of decisions. He dissolved the Iraqi army uh, and decided not to turn power over to an interim Iraqi government, but he would govern the country and himself. But uh, he, no, there was no decision making in Washington. The president never decided that. He simply delegated it to Bremer, who, who had been working on the issue for two weeks. Who did they recruit to run the country? Well, uh, anybody who's worked in post conflict uh, situations. Uh, knows that the first thing you want to do in a post-conflict situation is, you know, start getting people to work, clean up the rubble, get the electricity on, uh, get do employment. There were 13 billion dollars in Iraqi funds to be spent. Uh, you know, money from Iraqi oil sales and so on, and plus a lot of cash that we we got when we found went to Baghdad. 
Who did they put in charge of that? They put in charge of that six young people, the old, oldest of which was 24. Uh, they, one of them was the daughter of a prominent conservative activist. Now, how were they recruited? Well, they, they, they had gotten e they were part of a group of 13 young people who got emails saying, from the Pentagon saying, how would you like to go to Iraq and serve your country? Well, like some of you perhaps, uh, they didn't have anything else to do. Sounded like a good idea. So they said yes. They then never had a security clearance. They were never interviewed to see whether they had any competent skills. Of course, none of them had been in a post-conflict situation. None of them spoke Arabic. None of them knew anything about the Middle East. They were sent out there. The more senior people who were supposed to be in charge of spending this money never showed up, so they were put in charge of spending the money. And it turns out it's hard to spend $13 billion. So they, didn't, they spent maybe $100 million of it. What did that mean? A lot of unemployed, angry Iraqis. Uh, a lot of services that were not restored. And who were the victim? Who did they take their anger out? U.S. troops. And this is approach as being criminal negligence. Now, I, you know, perhaps you will see some strategic plan in all that. I don't believe there is. <laughs> hey, Mr. Ambassador, what you've laid out both in your speech today and in the book are accurate portrayals of what really happened, been there, done that for the last three years. What bothers me is we're weeks away from the congressional elections, the off-year elections. The debate among politicians is resolved down to forget for a minute who's chasing pages. <laughs> With regard to foreign policy, it boils down to the cut and run Democrats, so saith the administration, or the stay the course president. Is there nobody up there listening? Are they afraid to admit they know what happened? Or are we left with, since all we're concerned about if we're a congressman is retaining power, we're not going to discuss all that complicated stuff. And I'm dead serious. You work for a great group who's obviously as pertinent as anything else going on in the world right now, but we don't hear a word out of candidates or sitting legislators, let alone the damn administration, addressing these realities. Well, uh, I, I have a lot of sympathy for what you say. Uh, uh, the... Uh, I mean, I, obviously, uh, the, I don't think that one can characterize the Democrats as cut and run. Uh, and of course, a lot of Republicans are having a, a, a great doubts about the present course of action. The, the fact is the administration is, as I said, not serious about, uh, about victory. But what's, what's happening in this election campaign? Well, uh, the Democrats have adopted a very simple strategy, which is that uh, when the other fellow's uh, uh, on the top of a very high building and about to jump, there's no point in pushing. I mean, <laughs> the Republicans are committing suicide, so you know, they don't need to help out. Uh, and I, that probably is a good electoral strategy. I, would, it, I, mean, I think it's highly likely that uh, the Democrats will win both houses of Congress, frankly. But uh, it doesn't actually serve the national interest very well because there certainly needs to be an alternative. Now, there are several people who have come up with an alternative, most notably Joe Biden, who has, who has outlined something similar to what I've uh, outlined. Uh, there's also a um, candidate running in the second congressional district in New Hampshire, which is uh, across the Connecticut River from my home in Vermont, named Paul Hodes. It's a competitive race, and, and he's running very explicitly on the Galbraith plan. So, all of you, look at the second congressional district of New Hampshire on election night and see whether the plan wins. Uh, if he doesn't win, it's not my fault. It was, you know, it, was a, it, it, it required a big rising tide to get that one through. 
Well, once again, thank you very much, Ambassador. And uh, we could all uh, thank you one more time by uh, going out and buying the book. <laughs> there are multiple copies out there on the standstill and by giving us, uh, giving our visitor a final round of applause. Thank you.